But um, this evening, we are very privileged to be covering what I think is a very big issue at this point, particularly with the increasing levels uh, of inequality. And the, the idea that uh, basic income uh, has been muted, and also uh, the idea of universal basic services. And to really address this issue of inequality, increasing poverty, increasing uh, uh, levels of food banks, inability to really receive uh, basic, uh, achieve basic needs. And we've got two great speakers, uh, Stuart Lonsley, Lansley, who was originally uh, a journalist uh, and became a, um, an academic and has written a report in, in this area uh, on basic income, um, uh, sorry, book, there, I got that right, um, and Anna Kuth, um, who uh, works at the New Economics Foundation, has before that uh, the, the King's Fund, um, and has worked in public health, uh, thinking differently about the economy uh, uh, over a long uh, career, and has also recently uh, written about universal basic services. So we have two uh, top experts who have Divergent views, I think, uh, but we will explore how that goes. And each of them are going to uh, give a presentation uh, of about 20 uh, minutes or so. Uh, and then we're going to open up the floor uh, for a discussion. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, ask Stuart to the start. Thank you very much, Stuart. Okay. Well, thank you very much for, for, for coming. I mean, it's the hottest night of the year, so I think you know, you've done incredibly well. I mean. Uh, the good news is that uh, hopefully there will be no mention of Brexit and there will be no mention of the new management that are about to run the country. So uh, what we're actually going to be talking about is uh, ways in which we can tackle some of the most serious and, and deep-seated social issues of the day. Uh, that's we, 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 we're sitting on near record levels of poverty and inequality. We have a social security system that has been greatly weakened uh, over the last uh, decade and a half. Uh, and on top of that, we have declining opportunities uh, a, 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 a across the board, really, for current generations and future generations. Um, and uh, what I'm going to be talking about is whether there is a case for the first time to introduce an income floor into the UK a floor below which nobody would fall and which would be, act as a kind of base and spring for, springboard uh, for people to uh, build, uh, build their lives. Now, um, uh, the idea of uh, a basic in income, or the idea that everybody is entitled to a minimum living standard uh, as, as a social right <coughs> is something that's been around for a very long time. Um, is to be debated over, over hundreds of years. It was one of the drivers, the idea that, that everybody should, should be entitled to some kind of minimum income uh, was um, partly, partly one of the drivers of the national insurance scheme before the First War, World War. After the war, Bever a beverage report, uh, what he really thought he was creating, wanted to create, was an income floor. And he wanted to create an income floor essentially through national insurance, family allowances, and full employment. Now, in the event, we've never actually had a foolproof, unconditional, <coughs> robust income floor. In fact, we've had anything else. I mean, the income floor in the United Kingdom is zero. There are nine million people of working age who are economically inactive. Many of those are people who have been sanctioned and have ze uh, uh, their benefits have been taken away. Many of them is a small <coughs> army, mainly of women carers, most of whom also have no income. So, and and a, a, quite a lot of them are also people who have basically given up on the social security system. And one of the effects of this is that we are at near record levels of poverty. So the, the, lo the latest figures are that 22% um, of the population are poor on government definitions. Thir it's much higher for children, 30% uh, for children. Uh, these are slightly lower than the peak levels 30 years ago in the late 1980s, uh, when they were about one or two percentage points higher. In other words, we've made zero progress in 30 years. Now, poverty, um, these are interviews 
uh, that, that I did um, in a property project I, I was working on a short while ago. And they illustrate what it is, these are low income families, what it is to live on a low income today. People cannot afford the basics. They, you know, they very often go without meals, particularly women. You know, they can't afford to pay for full levels of heating. And there is also a lot of concern amongst people on benefits about the hostility that we've created as a society towards people uh, on uh, benefits. Now, um, essentially, what's happened in the United Kingdom is poverty has become institutionalized, i.e. it's embedded. It's embedded in the way the economy works, the way the society works, the way the housing market works, the way the social security system works, the way decisions are taken in corporate uh, boardrooms. And um, why, by institutionalized, if we go through some of the factors that are institutionalized, that are at the roots of high levels of poverty, low pay is endemic in Britain. We have an increasingly fragile labor market in which increase a small and growing minority have very, very insecure and low paid work. Homelessness has risen by nearly three times in the last a decade. Private rents have risen by 60% more than wages in the last decade. A recent report discovered that a third of private tenants, after they paid food, rent, um, and utility bills, have less than £30 a week to live on. Uh, so, um, food aid, you, remember the, you may remember this uh, poster by the, the, uh, the Church Action on Poverty, which caused quite a lot of problems with the government. Um, food aid has become institutionalised. Um, so going down through the list, uh, the, 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 the social security system that we now have is simply not up to the job of dealing with these problems. It's heavily dependent on means testing, and the, the effect of dependency on means testing means we are effectively capping people's ability to escape. Um, the, the total social security budget has been cut by 25%, it's £35 billion pound since 2010, largely by cutting the real value of a whole range of benefits. Um, the, the system is also highly punitive. I just want to show you this graph, uh, which is the number of sanctions that have taken place over the last, uh, since, since 2001. You can see that they were fairly high under Labour, running at about 250,000 people sanctioned a year. They then jumped to 1.1 million uh, and, and when the Conservative Party, when they came to power in 2010, greatly increased the penalties. Um, uh, and, and essentially what we've had in the last, uh, since 2010, 5 million people have been sanctioned, i.e. Their, in, their benefits have been increased. So it's not very surprising that you know, we've had this rush, increase in food banks, increase in homelessness, uh, and so on. So on. Um, now, I'm going to talk about the, essentially what we need. If we're going to deal with the, these embedded problems, we need to create uh, forces that are inbuilt into the economy that counter these forces towards driving poverty. And I think we're going to talk about two such inbuilt ideas tonight. I'm going to talk about basic income, and Anne is going to talk about uh, universal basic services. Um, now, the, a basic income is essentially when we give uh, every citizen a basic payment, weekly payment, no questions asked, unconditional, untaxed. And again, this will be a form of base on which people can build. Um, now, the idea of a basic income has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, uh, it's been in, in, in the last century, in the last 50 years alone, um, seven Nobel, Prize, Nobel laureates have advocated basic income. Many, many thinkers over many years have been advocating the idea of basic income. But despite that, it's always been seen as a utopian idea. It's always been seen as uh, slightly eccentric, and the people who advocate basic income, you know, haven't really got their feet very firmly on the ground. But it's become uh, it's been rising up the p political agenda in the last few years, partly because of rising poverty, rising inequality, the failures of the social security system, 
uh, concerns about automation on work, and also because there's been a big global debate abroad, and to some extent the UK is actually behind uh, the debate abroad. Ab abroad. Um, now there are very many strengths uh, to a basic income, I mean it's a controversial idea, and I'm only really going to get a go through the strengths, but it would create an income floor below which nobody would fall, something we've never ever had. It would boost the universal base of social security. Beveridge always intended that the bulk of the social security system should be universal. But actually what's happened over the last 50 years is that it's become increasingly based on means testing. Um, it would, for the first time, provide an income uh, for unpaid work carers, people who are volunteers, and so on. And we are talking about millions of people who basically have no income, uh, who do this kind of uh, unpaid work. Um, it's also potentially very empowering, because what it does, it gives people much more choice, because they know they've got this weekly income, much more choice over whether to work or not, or what kind of work to do, whether to do a bit more retraining, whether to set up a small business, or, or whether to go into caring. So it gives people empowerment. It gives people a much wider you know, to a op series of options about how they're going to manage their lives uh, than at, uh, uh, at the moment. Um, it can also be It's also non-judgmental, unlike the present benefit system. It would eliminate this idea of a disciplinary state. Um, and it's totally non-judgmental about the choices that people make. It can also be uh, introduced mentally. Um, um, now, the big question, that, 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 I mean, it, it is controversial, and there are a lot of critics of uh, basic income, and one of the main criticisms is that you can't actually introduce a basic income at a level that's affordable. Or if you do introduce it at a level of, of it's affordable, it just wouldn't be worth doing. Um, so um, what I've been doing with uh, this organization called Compass is modeling a number of different uh, types of basic income to see whether that's true, to see whether it's possible and feasible to introduce a basic income that's worth having. Now, uh, there are two basic models of uh, basic income. The first one is what we call Big Bang. This is a model which essentially um, uh, would abolish the, the existing social security system completely, pay everybody an income equal to the poverty line. Um, and uh, this is advocated particularly by the sort of, sort of post-war, post-capitalist uh, thinkers who believe basic income is the route to the end of capitalism. Um, now, we've, we've, we've modelled that system and it, it, it doesn't work. It's impossible to make it work in the short term. It would either be too expensive, or it would be um, it would be um, th there would be too many losers. So what we've done is we've looked at an alternative system, which we call a partial model. And the partial model would keep the existing social security system. It, the basic income would be grafted onto it, um, and the the level of payments wouldn't be enough to eliminate poverty. Um, but they, they, they would be enough to give people quite a lot of new security. And the rates that we, that we are applying is uh, £40 for a child, £60 for an adult, uh, £175 for an adult over 65. And this means, for example, a couple with two children under the scheme would get £10,400 a year. No questions asked. That's guaranteed. They know that money is coming and it comes in on a weekly basis. Um, now, this system works. Um, uh, it's, um, it's incredibly pro progressive. It cuts poverty by uh, significant amounts. It cuts the level of inequality. Gini coefficient is a, is a, a, a measure of inequality. The, the level of inequality falls and the level of mean testing falls by uh, 11%. Um, the, tax changes that uh, are required to make this system work, we'd have to increase the marginal rate of income tax by 3p in the pound. Uh, we'd also abolish the, the, abolish the personal tax allowance. Um, and the effect of this scheme is, as I say, to, to substantial reductions in poverty. Uh, and it, this could be introduced at zero cost, I, at zero revenue cost. So, 
Those critics who say it's impossible to introduce a scheme at different levels without huge increases in taxation are simply wrong. Now, we also uh, we tested two schemes altogether. Uh, this scheme, which is uh, revenue neutral, we also tested a scheme which introduced a lower, a lower tax rate band at 15p in the plan. The reason we did that is in order to more or less eliminate the losers. There are a few losers in, amongst the poorest in this scheme, and that would cost 27 billion. Now, now 27 billion is obviously you know, not an insubstantial amount of money, but it's two thirds of the cuts that have taken place in the Social Security budget since 2010. In other words, uh, we could go back to 2010, introduce this scheme, save quite a bit of money, and have a much more progressive system of, uh, of, of basic uh, income. Um, and there are various, well I'll skip this, I'm probably, how, how long have I got? Uh, you about need to wind up quite soon. Okay, all right, well, well I just, a what does, a basic, a, a social dividend, um, a citizen dividend paid from the UK's accumulated wealth pool. The idea here really is that, is that the level of wealth in Britain has increased from three times the size of the economy 40 years ago to six times today. Now, um, that well, wealth is incredibly unequally distributed, much more unequally distributed than income and than personal wealth. So, almost entirely privately owned. In the 1950s and 60s, a third of wealth was publicly owned. It was collectively owned. Now it's 12%, and that's largely because of privatisation, and also because there's been a huge increase in unearned, unearned income. So a lot of this wealth boost is unearned. I mean, to sort of give you an example, um, nearly all land is privately owned now. We've sold off huge chunks of land, but in 2016 alone, the gain to landowners from planning permission was £11 billion. So you can see that the effect of private ownership of land is to boost the rates of return to the rich, and that's what, that's what sets the inequality into this permanent upward cycle. Um, now, uh, th there, is a lot to pick, there is a long argument that natural resources like land, and also a lot of this uh, pr property and industrial uh, base that we've been created, been created over hundreds of generations, um, and they should not be privately owned. At least a significant part of them should be socialised. All of us should be gaining from the exploitation of land, from the exploitation of productive base which has been created by partly by state subsidies, but very little of it is. So our basic plan is that is to. Uh, raise the level of basic income that we looked at earlier on by socialising um, a portion of this wealth um, in what we call a citizen's wealth fund. A citizen's wealth fund is, is essentially a socially owned bundle of wealth. Um, and this would give everybody, everybody would own it. It would be owned by the people. It would, everybody would have a people's stake. It would be pro-equality, would build in another, this is the second mechanism for building in pro, an anti-poverty, pro-equality pro uh, mechanism. Um, it would be run by a board of guardians, uh, so it would be independent of the state. And is this idea utopian? It is not utopian. Uh, we know about um, the, the, some of the uh, state uh, investment funds that, 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 are, that, are, that, that many countries introduced, nearly all based on oil. Norway is probably the, the best known one. Uh, Alaska uh, has also created a wealth fund based upon oil. Uh, they pay an annual dividend, which is worth about, on average, of j just over $1,000. They've been paying it for 30 years. And that's been transformative. So the, and, and we also have one in Shetland. Shetland created a citizen's wealth fund 20 years ago, again out of oil, and they've used the returns from that to build social infrastructure across Shetland. They, they're creating all their uh, care homes, children's homes, leisure centres out of this scheme. Now, there isn't time to go into how, how we can build it. 
Um, I just want to show you the final slide, uh, which, is, which is the scale, the size of this fund that would be created if we spent £25 billion pound a year. And so the total level of wealth, private wealth, is 12, billion, is 12 trillion. So we're talking about you know, less than 1%, um, or, or about 1%. Um, and over 10 years, uh, putting this money in and investing it would create uh, a fund worth half a trillion pounds. That's a quarter of the size of the economy. After 20 years, it would be 750 billion. And after 30 years, it would be almost a trillion. So you, we can create large sums of funds that can be used, uh, owned by the people that can be used to pay a social dividend, which is a basic income. This is very long term, but it would be totally transformative of the kind of society we live in today. Sorry, a bit rushed. Thank you very much, Stuart. You want to come out? Yes, yes I would. Uh, so you can see, take a seat, and Anna, you're, you should be next um, if we go down. Yeah. I can just put so I'm not like, don't raise that. Have we raised that? You one? want to raise that? It, no, this one, it doesn't seem to raise. <laughs> I've tried to. Yeah. Never mind. It just falls down again. All right. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to talk about the case for universal basic services. We did originally develop these ideas as an antidote to a certain version of the UBI idea. Now, the first thing we have to remember is that there are many, many different versions of the proposal for a universal basic income. And much of what Stuart says I completely agree with. I think the idea about a social wealth fund is brilliant. And in fact, in a way, if you think about the Alaska model and the Shetland model, I'm for the Shetland model where they pay for the services through the development of a social wealth fund rather than giving payments to individuals. But we'll come back to that. So um, this is a sneak preview of the front cover of our, of our book that we've uh, written, I've written with Andrew Percy, who's not here, I'm afraid, um, to, uh, for Policy Press, it's coming out for next year, publishers take ages, um, and it's the case for universal basic services. And the, 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 the basic idea here is it's about reclaiming the collective ideal and working together to meet the needs that we all share. And we do this by enlarging the social wage so if you like, Stuart's been talking about a money income, and I'm talking about the social wage. Um, and why does this matter now? Well, I mean, the, Stuart made a very good case for uh, the reason why we need to take action about poverty, but there's more to it than that. I'd say, yes, we have widening inequalities, deepening poverty, and we also have accelerating um, ex an acceleration towards uh, an ecological catastrophe, which has to be the kind of number one priority for all our policy development, because otherwise there won't be a society for us to make social policies for. Um, we also have the problem of the, the collective values of the post-war settlement has given way to market values of individualism, choice, competition and consumerism. And public services have been really seriously undermined by austerity and anti-state politics. And of course, you've got the problem of the robotics and AI transforming the labor market and taking away quite a lot of jobs. So these are the reasons why it matters now. It's not just about poverty. It's about all these other reasons, too. So UBI, UBI universal basic services. The best way I can explain this concept is in using the terms in reverse order. So you've got services by which we mean Collectively generated, service, uh, uh, collectively generated activities that serve the public interest. Basic means that services that are essential and sufficient, rather than just minimal, to enable people to meet their needs. And universal means that everybody is entitled to services that are sufficient to meet their needs, regardless of ability to pay. And the guiding principles are firstly shared needs. 
life's essentials that enable us to survive and flourish, that are common to all of us, and they're different from our wants and our preferences. So it's important to understand that this idea is underpinned by the concept of need. And then collective responsibilities, that's about pooling resources and sharing risks so that we can all meet all our needs. And that's the fundamental basis of social life. And then we have sustainable development, which is about meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And some of you might spot that that's a quote from the Brundtland Report, and it's the classic definition of sustainable development. It's about needs. We must meet our needs now, but not uh, if we're going to compromise the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So these are the guiding principles behind the idea of universal basic services. Now, I want to say, I'm sorry these slides are rubbish, but um, listen to what I say, don't worry too much, but um, a bit more about shared needs because it is so important. So we all have um, basic needs, and these needs are universal across time and space. And there's a lot of need theory. We have one of the leading need theorists here, Ian Goff, um, who, uh, and he with his, with his uh, co-author, Len Doyle, identified health and critical autonomy as the basic human needs in order for people to participate in society. So um, that's health, critical autonomy, and social participation. <coughs> and that was echoed by Martha Nussbaum, who identified three core <coughs> capabilities, which are affiliation, bodily integrity, and practical reason. And these two um, ideas of what needs and capabilities are overlap a lot. And they're almost um, the same, in fact. So these needs are shared across time and space. And then there are what we might call intermediate needs, which are how we, what we need in order to meet our basic needs. And these would include um, water, nutrition, shelter, secure and non-threatening work, education, healthcare, security <coughs> in childhood, significant primary relationships, physical and economic security, and a safe environment. Now, um, this is not just me saying it, this is the, the basis of, of the theory that we need that, we need these intermediate needs in order to meet our basic needs. And they too are common to all, although they are, they are capable of evolving because very recently, people who've been thinking about you know, what do we need to survive and flourish have identified access to motorized transport and to um, the internet, basically, are also intermediate needs in today's world. Um, so, these needs are consistent, and how they meet, how they're met, will vary very widely between times, places, and cultures. So, needs are met in many different ways, but we do have this consistency across time and space with both basic needs and most intermediate needs. And that's where we st our starting point for thinking about <coughs> universal basic services. So, um, now we get on to the social wage. Now, there's some people in the back there who have been um, writing and thinking about the social wage much longer than I have. And um, so, but it's a very useful concept and, and uh, fact, and it's something that we need to think more about. It's kind of gone off the political agenda, if you like. So, if you think back to the needs, so we all expect to buy for ourselves some of life's essentials. So, for example, food and clothing provided we have enough money to do that. And there are some things that we all need, but we can only afford to buy them ourselves if there are public policies in place that ensure that they are free or genuinely affordable for all. And examples there would include housing, perhaps access to motorized transport and to digital information. And then there are some things that we all need, but we can only afford them if we're rich and lucky. This is where there's a risk there that some people might, uh, might be unlucky and need a lot of expensive health care, for example, and, and would be absolutely in ruins financially if they had to pay for it themselves. So these are um, other kinds of needs where there, you can only afford them if you're rich. So the social wage is vital. It's vital to provide, firstly, income support so that everyone has enough money to pay for affordable essentials. And secondly, and most importantly, in my view, collective services 
to provide life's essentials that people can't afford to pay for themselves. So that is a kind of virtual income, and that's the social wage. And what we're trying to do with UBS is to enlarge and improve the quality of the social wage. So here in the is the UBS proposal. We want more and better public services available to all according to need, not capacity to pay. So we want to improve and extend existing services, such as schooling and healthcare, but to expand the range to include things like childcare, adult social care, housing, transport, access to digital information, and arguably more things too. I mean, you could talk, you could think about the utilities, about energy and so on. I, our analysis focuses on the um, sort of providential and relational sphere, if you like, the social sphere. So, and we want these things with, alongside, a reform system of income support that is sufficient and non-stigmatizing for all who need it, so that no one's income falls below uh, a democratically agreed level. So we want the two together, but one without the other won't do. And how is this radical? Firstly, Reclaiming the collective ideal is a radical thing to do these days. It's been submerged and discredited by neoliberal politics, and we need it because it is the only way that we can all meet all of our needs. It's radical because it promotes sustainable development, which um, that's because a needs-based approach allows for this, allows for sufficiency. Whereas a wants-based approach to it, you know, everyone buys what they want. There's no, no limit to it. And it aims to transform public services so that they're controlled by the people who use them and need them and adequately supported by public funds. So there's a big story in there about we're not just asking for more of the same. We want to transform public services as we go. And a bit more than that... Um, so just some points here. First of all, we should see investment in public services as investment in the social infrastructure, valuing and building that infrastructure rather than just as public expenditure. We can learn a lot from the experience of the universal basic services we already have, which include the NHS and um, schooling up to the age of uh, the primary and secondary schooling. Um, and there's plenty to build on, both learning from the successes and the failures of those services. We need inclusive and enforceable entitlements to services so that everyone has the right to the services that they need when they need it. And so introducing this idea of entitlement is a change of direction or it's, a, it's, it's confirming something that most people sort of assume. Do we have a right to the NHS? Actually, probably <coughs> not. If you look at the NHS constitution, it's not very clear whether we could actually enforce our right to healthcare. Do we have a right to schooling? Well, up to a point. So, but for all these services, we would like to see um, enforceable entitlements. And we want mu multiple owner models of ownership so that we could encourage co-ops and social enterprises providing services um, and also to eliminate profiteering. So we would want a a plural field of providers, not just the state providing, and certainly not the big corporations cleaning off profits. Now what this implies is the need for a new dynamic between top-down and bottom-up politics, grounded in democratic dialogue, not got time to go into that. But this is very important. There are key roles for the state that we must identify and be clear about and hang on to. Firstly, the state is there to ensure equal access to services. Secondly, it's there to set and enforce quality standards. Thirdly, it's there to collect and distribute funds for the services. And fourthly, it's there to coordinate the services because they don't just, they shouldn't just operate in silos. They, you'll get the best results if they're well coordinated between them. So that's where the state comes in, not necessarily as a direct provider, but as um, with, with these four roles to perform. So now, I could go on forever about uh, UBS in practice. I've written a lot about it. I haven't got time this evening. I'll just point out here that there are examples in other countries. For example, Norway is a really good exemplar for childcare. 
where it's pretty near what we would want in terms of a universal basic childcare service. For adult social care, well, we know, don't we, now, Boris Johnson's going to fix all that, so we don't need to worry about that, but just in case he doesn't, there's some quite good examples in other countries, including particularly Germany. And in housing, well, there's a lot we can learn from places like Vienna and Copenhagen about um, public ownership of land, about how to make housing affordable and of high quality. Across it. So we're looking for where we can learn and what, how we can build these services, because each service requires a customised approach. There isn't one single formula for creating a universal basic service. They have things in common, but each one will have a different provisioning system and needs to be done in a different way. So this is a complicated agenda. On transport, well, we thought it would be ideal to start with free buses. I said we can learn from France because they've got a very good system of subsidising transport, but there are free bus services in Tallinn and Luxembourg and in other countries. And a lot depends not just on the bus services being free, but on them being well connected and going to places where people need them and taking people to places where they need to go. Uh, and information, well, essentially we're saying this should be regarded as a utility, not a commodity, with a, a universal service obligation. <coughs> so the benefit... Now, um, in a nutshell again, universal basic services bring benefits across four dimensions. So equality. Public services are highly redistributed. And they're worth far more to low-income households. We would have to spend something like three quarters of their disposable income if services such as healthcare and education went through. And it's been estimated that they would they reduce income inequalities by around 20% across the OECD countries. Now, in terms of efficiency, most public services are more efficient at meeting needs than markets. We've seen the failures of the market systems introduced to public services in the UK since the early 90s, and um, individualism, competition and choice have failed to drive up standards or make um, services universally available. There are economies of scale with services as compared with individual purchase, and you get no profiteering under this system. And you get handsome social and economic returns from the investment that you make in the social infrastructure. So in that sense, it is very efficient, although you have to challenge some of the conventional ways of measuring efficiency. And solidarity. Now, if you've got a system based on pooling resources and sharing risks, that can build a sense of mutual regard, of empathy, and interdependence. <coughs> Um, calculations based on individual self-interest tend to do the opposite and drive people apart. So we think that this approach will help to build up solidarity. And then sustainability. Well, quality public services can help to prevent harm to health and social well-being um, that would otherwise trigger demand for more costly ser curative services. And uh, that would, you know, it's a bad thing on many fronts. Um, it can generate secure employment and help to stabilise the economy because um, pub public service jobs tend to act as a counter-cyclical buffer in times of downturn, so it can help to stabilise um, in that sense. And it can help to reduce GHG emissions and to safeguard natural resources, partly because these services will be regulated through a democratic state and will be more amenable to directions for what they should do about cutting emissions and and using uh, what resources they're use, using. And, um, and so there's a, there's a very substantial advantage in terms of sustainable development by having universal public services rather than a system based on people having more money and buying what they want. Although there's not a simple dichotomy between these things, I wouldn't want to suggest that's what Stuart is saying. So now we get on to the question of UBS and cash payments. Both are essential, as I've said, but how far are they compatible? Now, our estimated cost for the UBS program that we've proposed is around 45% of GDP across OECD countries. Um, it's very hard to estimate precisely, <coughs> and there's a lot more work to be done. It'd be good to get Stuart working on this, actually, 
so to do the modelling to get a, a better idea of, of the cost. But we're thinking around 45% of GDP compared to the 6% that was spent bailing out the banks after the financial crash. And so it's um, it is a it's, it's a possible sum. The estimated cost of a sufficient universal basic income, which is where Stewart's proposal is heading, um, has been uh, estimated by the ILO as between 20 and 30 percent of GDP. So there's a big question there as to how far do you want to go with the idea of basic income, because the further you go, the more it costs. <coughs> now, an income support scheme that guaranteed a minimum for all could cost less and it is possible to combine UBS with a weekly national allowance, and kind of my colleague um, Alfie Sterling at the Economics Foundation has proposed, um, which is not enough to, not nearly enough to live on, but is um, uh, paid to everybody. And this is a desirable political goal. But it wouldn't, at that level, achieve the kinds of things that Stuart would like to achieve in terms of. Um, in terms of what he said at the beginning of his proposal, it would do very little to reduce poverty, and very little to reduce inequality, depending on the level. It's the threshold that counts, and the trade-offs. If the aim is to progress towards a higher basic income, and then to a sufficient universal basic income, this becomes incompatible with UBS for fiscal and political reasons. It's a question of priorities. Only a modest income support scheme is compatible with a programme to build more and better public services. Beyond that, the costs, absor the costs of a, a, a larger U basic income scheme absorb funds that are needed for services and risk further dismantling the welfare state. And that's why basic income schemes are very popular with free market enthusiasts. And you can't spend the same money twice. So if you want to abolish the personal tax allowance to pay for basic income, you can't use it to improve and extend public services. Additional funds, if they were available, for example, from a social wealth fund, which is a great idea, this is where the Alaska versus Shetland thing comes in, would be needed urgently for other things, for social infrastructure and also for a green infrastructure and for climate mitigation. So do we want to, we're going to build up a social uh, wealth fund, should we be spending it all on cash payments to individuals or developing a social infrastructure and a green infrastructure? That's the question. Basic income schemes, even partial ones, do little, as I've said, to reduce poverty or inequality. They do a bit, but not very much. They're less efficient than services for meeting needs. They risk undermining solidarity because they're based on the idea of individuals getting money and then going out and buying whatever they want. And they do nothing to promote sustainable development. An enlarged social wage would also mean a lower income floor would be sufficient to meet needs and flourish. So if you're getting more through a social wage, that minimum level uh, might might be more manageable. So they, they have to be seen together in that way. So let me just conclude. Um, my suggestion is let's work together to build more and better collective services, free for all at the point of need, not ability to pay, plus a cash distribution scheme that gives everyone a guarantee that their income will not fall below an agreed level. I think we must admit that there are no silver bullets, and I put this in because there are many advocates of, of UBI who put it forward as though it was some kind of magical solutions to all the problems that we've got. Pooling <laughs> resources and sharing risks so that all our basic needs are met requires a complex, many-sided political program. That's politics, and that's reality. And I think we hope we can acknowledge that collective services, provided that they're well organized, democratically controlled, and adequately funded, are the best hope we have for promoting equality, efficiency, solidarity, and sustainability. And let's agree, if we can, that UBI, that the idea of UBI 
holds many dangers when it promises that cash handouts to individuals are the best solution to problems of poverty, inequality, and changing labor markets. So that's what I would like us to agree on. I mean, I really don't think there's a lot of distance between Stuart and me. It's a matter of how far you go and where you want to spend the money. Thank you. Thank you. Stuart, you, uh, you come up. Thank you both very much. Um, I think as far as I can say, the big difference is sort of more collective versus more individual. Um, but uh, what sort of questions would people like to ask? <coughs> One thought that occurs to me with uh, universal basic income, what guarantee is there that it won't just push up house prices or rented accommodation? We've had uh, there's a help to buy scheme which has pushed up, I'm told, prices for houses for £33,000 in London. So isn't there a danger that under our present system it will end up in higher house prices? Okay. So will it fuel inflation prices? Can we have a, uh, maybe another one? Yeah. Um, I, th I think Robert. there's a lot to be said for um, universal basic services in areas like the NHS where there is clearly a public will to do it. Um, on the other hand, um, I do some work with people who are homeless and what I, my experience has tended to be that it's the people who are just below the working ability level. If you're really disabled, the service is possible. Um, if you're really able, you get a job. But if you're just below the level at which you get a job, but not sufficiently disabled to get a service, then you run into problems. And that's where I think the universal basic income would happen. Mm -hmm. So we've got, hitting this particular target, we've got Jamie. Yeah, uh, more on the service side of things. But from what you said, it just sounds like there isn't any country that currently covers all of these, you're about Norway and childcare, so like individual, but for all of them, there is no country that does that. So do you think maybe that suggests that they're not so basic, or that all the countries in the world are really significantly failing this? Well, it's should we... Very, which is very important. <laughs> <laughs> it's a genuine question. So, yes, that we've moved into a state where everyone's in a bad place. Um, Stuart, we, we'll take these. Stuart, could you start, just address the question of... Um, that if you increased income, this would fuel inflation, effectively, or push up prices? Well, I mean, the, 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 you're, not to, you're not increasing the income base totally. What you're doing is the income is going on the lowest income families. So, uh, and all the evidence is, uh, from, there have been lots and lots of studies that what happens to ca cash transfers going to low income families. The money goes on very, very basic things. It goes on child, it goes on, you know, helping children, it goes on diet, it goes on a bit of social participation. Um, it certainly isn't going to go, you know, we're not talking about the sort of money that would in, in, inflate demand for, for housing. If anything, it would have the opposite effect because you'd actually be reducing the incomes of um, rich, the, the richest people um, modestly. So you would actually, if anything, you'd probably lower the demand for housing. But I think. The, 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 the social wealth fund, the, the, this idea, which would be funded through taxation and wealth, I mean, wealth at the moment is, I mean, it's remarkable that wealth is 12 billion, it's six times the size of the economy. Uh, wealth is taxed at the rate of about 2%. Income, which is six times smaller, is taxed at the rate of about 32%. And that huge wealth pool privately wealth pool is the source of house price inflation. So the, the proposal to socialise gradually some of that private wealth and put it into a fund that's owned by all people on the ground that this this wealth should be shared is completely wrong <coughs> that it's, you know that hundreds of years of productive labour and all the rest of it, the proceeds of that go to people lucky enough to, to afford it. So it would have the opposite effect, it would, it would actually, you know, it would um, reduce the demand for housing. So what about this sort of intermediary people between the uh, the people who are really disabled and the people who can work? 
I, is income or services going to be better at addressing that sort of class? Well, clearly you need a combination of both. And I mean, yeah. one of the answers to the housing issue is that you've got to you've got to have a policy, a set of policies. You've got to be able to fund a set of policies that make housing affordable and of high quality and very different from what we've got now. I mean, our housing, as we, I'm sure most people in this room know, is a complete nightmare. So, and if, if you're talking about people who are, who are sort of on that cusp between being able to work and not being able to work, they need services. Of course they need services. What happens when they're ill? What happens if they want to get from A to B? What happens if they need a home? Uh, this is what the services are all about. So they, but they would also need an income. And that's where I would say we need a, a system of income support that guarantees that no one's income falls below an agreed level. That sorts that out. But, you know, it's it, because people who've got nothing, who, who don't earn, could then be paid a, a decent income if you're not also paying it to everyone. That's a whole other story. So, and I was asked, no country, well, no, but, you know, should that hold us back? But this, I think this, I, I thought that's really important point because aren't we un underneath all this we've seen huge increases in inequality driven by various social dynamics changes in values and so forth mm. and you're both really saying we need to be more generous we need to do the opposite of the, where the trends are going and that is obviously true but how do you change those underlying social dynamics so that there is the will I mean that the, the last the, the government has been pushing austerity and demonising the poor for the last 10 years and no one seems to have minded too much apart from the people in question. So is that, um, you know... Did we they, not mind? No, but we, I'm saying we as well, but they keep getting elected. So how do you take society in a different way so that there's enough of a momentum to move in a positive direction, even any direction, that, that actually reduces inequality? I think I'd start by giving... Um, a decent funding to local authorities. Yes, but that's the answer. But how would you get people to vote yeah, no, no, to well, put I'm a not, government? Yeah. I'm answering your question. Okay, good. You have to demonstrate what's possible. And you can start doing that at local authority level. We're doing exactly the opposite now because they're being starved of funds and they can't get them to do less and less. And so people think, oh, well, there's no point. You know, let's just, um, uh, you know, that people are, people are despairing. But if you ca you can demonstrate that things work well, you can draw attention to the the services in specific countries where they're working very much better than they are here and you can start to demonstrate through encouraging and supporting local authorities to, to provide decent housing, decent transport, um, decent access to the but internet. But who's the you? Childcare. Who's the you? Not the presumably you're not going to be in charge. No, we're talking about a democratic... Well, I know, um, but change. that doesn't exist at the moment. So how no. is that you going to be empowered to do those things this that you're suggesting? How, you know, I, this is what you do in, in this world. You have an idea about how you want change to be made. You know that it's going to be difficult. And you have to start to create a climate of opinion that will begin to shift things. That's what the uh, neoliberals did or the, um, the right wing did when they wanted to shift the uh, prevailing paradigm, if you like, away from uh, a collective to an individual system based on competition and choice. And we need to push back in the other direction. And we do that by what we say, by what we demonstrate about how we vote our leaders in and our politicians. And we, I would say that if, when we get to the point when this becomes possible, and it may come quite soon, we start by demonstrating what can be done at a local level. We start by electing leaders who will say this. I mean, you know, this is kind of... I, mean, yeah. I think it's if, if, we, if we look back at some of the most progressive social reforms of the last hundred years, um, they all took a long time to happen. So the, the National Health Service, there was a very, very big debate starting in the mid-1920s about nationalising the health service. And there was a lot of debate going on about doctors and about uh, social policy people and so on. The same with family allowance. I mean, it, the, family, the idea of family allowance was being promoted uh, in, 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 in the, in the mid-1920s. So two ideas that were being promoted over the... It took 20 years... And the war? At, well, there are lots of other factors. Of course. <laughs> I mean, the war and, and the change in public opinion and the recession and so on. Obviously, you know, there's no simple answer to this. Um, but th there are some, I mean, if you take the later period, the minimum wage, for example, which is now one of the most popular things, you know, social policies in Britain, 
um, the low pay unit, which was set up in 1971, which first started campaigning uh, for, uh, for a minimum wage, it, it took them well, 30 years, but it happened. Um, so they, you, know, you, you can change opinion, you can build. There's no shortcuts to this. I mean, it's, it's going to be impossible to, to get uh, a system of universal basic service and basic income implemented in the next five years. It's just not going to happen. We need a national campaign. We need to persuade big thinkers. We need newspapers to back it. It needs a campaign. It needs. It'll probably take as long as, it, as the minimum wage, as, as some of the, uh, the the campaign for child benefit, the campaign for. So, I mean, I'm not. You know, and what we need is 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 political leadership, and we, we basically need a political party uh, that gives leadership that that, that that leads people with you. I mean, that's what. So it, you have to fire on lots of different cylinders. You have to make the case. You have to sh demonstrate that these work. And then you have to go, there's no shortcut. You go around meetings after meetings after meetings, selling the ideas. I mean, the, I, I mean basic income was, was, was seen as, as a lunatic idea. I mean, Anna you know, still thinks it's a little bit lunatic. But I mean, you know, but, 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 but has shifted quite dramatically. Um, Right, we'll go, we'll go to the back. We've got three women at the back, one off the other, because we just have, I think, three men. Um, uh, I just wanted to know a bit more from Anna about uh, what she means by a cash distribution scheme that gives everyone a guarantee that their income will not fall below an agreed level, um, whether that means a, a means-tested um, income or not. I knew you were going to ask me that, Fran. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we just, we'll just take the other um, three questions at the back. Yeah. yeah. So my, my question was, uh, how do you get from A to B? And one of the problems is that when you have uh, a, a universal basic income or a benefit, um, it actually, at the moment, subsidizes um, um, in industry. Um, uh, so shops can employ people at below um, the rate that people live at because they know the state is going to is going to subsidise them and landlords can charge rents which are much larger than the market would support because they know that their housing benefits will be pay. So I, I just think um, how do we get when we have this system where there there is any uh, private industry at all, um, how do we get to this to this arrangement? Because I think in the meantime we, it, it will be subsidising private pockets and I don't quite see how you get from these people. Yeah. Um, I think the universal basic income is quite radical and quite it could be politically quite attractive. Um, it's been proposed it can be implemented within a, uh, one parliament and you're saying how can we fund it? We don't really um, so, so you'll have to speak up a bit yeah, or sorry. wait for this to it doesn't include having, you know, the service as well. They are really important, but it's such a, you know, utopian idea or, you know, a difficult thing to implement. But how, how do you think you could even make a start of persuading people to vote for it and to bring it a significant amount in the first parliament five mm -hmm. years? Okay, so we've got a particular technical question that Anna knows the answer to, I think, on the, the how you would design a, uh, a cash support. So we just... Do you want to take that one first? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, will, I will come to it. I just want, while it's in my mind, I just want to say you're saying how will we get to where, we're, where we want to go to. I mean, th there's a lot of interest in universal basic services in the Labour leadership team. Um, I begin to despair about whether it can ever possibly win an election, but they are really seriously interested. They get the point about collective services they get the point about shared needs. They get the point about equality, efficiency, solidarity, and sustainability. <coughs> and um, so, you know, that's the start. And we can, we, I think that would be the best way yeah, to go. I, I think my question was more directed at the universal basic income than, base, than services. Well, if you, uh, I mean, my point, sorry, well, we have to get Stuart to answer that question then. <laughs> but my point is, you should start with the services, actually. I mean, we have to reform the... Um, and to come back to what um, <coughs> Fran was asking me, 
Um, I mean, Fran has been working on this with others for for decades, and it's sort of, sort of, in a way, it's a council of despair. I think to say, well, the only thing we can do is go for UBI, if that means um, a, a basic a basic income scheme that that threatens to uh, withdraw funds from collective services, because if we go down the individual choice market-based solution to meeting our needs, then I think we are um, on, a, on a really, really dangerous route. So I suppose I would have to say to you, Fat Fran, if, if we, you and I got in a room together, you, you know what all the historical problems about getting a decent, basic, uh, a, an income that people can rely on. I think we can both remember times when it was more generous, when it was less stigmatizing, when the things that Stuart was suggesting at the beginning of, of his talk didn't really happen in that way. There was no, it hadn't been institutionalized. Now, I think we could move in that direction. So I'm sure there are things we can do. It, you know, if we can only do it by giving money to everyone and then clawing it back with- I, I wasn't arguing that. I was just asking what you meant by what you're say, suggesting as the income part of your- well, okay, so first of all, so it's not something that we, we're focusing on the services, right? But we absolutely recognise that income is important too, for the reasons I hope I explained. That, you know, we can't, uh, we can't just give things, to, give services to everyone and nobody needs any disposable income. That's crazy. So I'm assuming we could agree through democratic dialogue what the minimum, what the income floor should be. And that would be affected by the quality of public services. Because if you didn't have to pay for childcare, for example, um, and, and then we would decide what to do. I mean, one obvious way is to, you know, to, to vamp up child benefit. It's just such an obvious thing to do. So, but I don't have a, a complete answer to your question, and I think there's work to be done there. And, you know, we can work together, perhaps. Ian, yeah. yeah. ah, sorry, Stuart, I mean, do you want to take... Well, can, can I ju just say something about, you know, that... that, that um, uh, this, this, you know, idea of um, basic income versus universal basic services. I mean, uh, the, the, the advocates of a basic income don't see it as competitive. We don't see ours as superior or, or vice versa. What we see is both are needed. I mean, uh, the, the, you know, beverage after the war, he didn't say you can have national insurance or family allowance or the NHS. So you will not never say how you're going to pay for the services. No, 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 let me finish. The, the, our, our basic, the, the, the basic income we're proposing, the partial basic income, which is, which is not a full, all glowing, it's, it's a modest one, is, 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 can be made revenue neutral. And the elements of it are supported by NEF. I mean, so when you say we should double child benefit, of course we should, and that's one of, there's four steps involved in our partial basic income. The first is the conversion of the personal allowance into a cash payment. And that is net revenue neutral. And that, that is incredibly progressive. With the, the graphs in our, in our pamphlet, which I passed around, show how progressive that would be. Um, child benefit, the increase in child benefit um, could be financed by, by higher taxes. The introduction of a young people's benefit which I think is really desperately needed for under 25s. But, you know, young people are, you know, the, the, the really the worst, the most badly effective of all groups. So, in other words, the, the, the steps, I think people who support the UBS and sort of say UBS is in competition with basic income, quite a lot of your that school also support these steps. So they support the transfer oh, yes. of personal okay. assets. So they, tra they support the increase in, so in effect, if you are signing up, this to is, this the is need to raise incomes of the poorest. Absolutely, absolutely agree with that. The point is, do you stop there? Because you then go on, sorry, point at you in that way, to talk <laughs> about a social wealth fund that yeah. would increase the basic income. Now, if you were prepared to say, yes, let's have a, base, uh, a social wealth fund, and let's use it for social infrastructure, for better services, and for ramping up you know, the, the social wage, fine, I'm with you, we're absolutely there. It's, it's the, the, uh, t <coughs> the almost inevitable slide from saying basic in income's a good idea along the lines that you're suggesting. Now you may not, but you did actually say you wanted to use your social wealth fund income to give people more money. Why? 
when you could do, use it to have decent well, childcare, decent adult social care, better housing, better transport. <coughs> so why not use it as Shetland did, as opposed to Alaska, who gave everyone a tiny bit of money that um, you, know, you couldn't even starve on, let alone flourish on. Um, and you say it was transformative. No, it wasn't, Stuart. The Alaska Fund gave people, it's very popular, but it doesn't transform people's lives. It doesn't relieve child poverty, only mm. slightly in some communities. I mean, I've looked at all this evidence, just mm. not true. So, what have a social wealth fund, then let's use the money from a social wealth, let's keep your um, partial basic income, as you call it, at a, at a, a modest level, yes. right? And then what you do with all the rest of our political energy and our funds and all the other things that we're trying to do is we, we go down the collective road. So we use the social wealth fund and anything else that might come to build more and better collective services to meet shared needs. That's what I've been with you all the way. Well, I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't think there's any, any fundamental differences on that. You know, but I, you know, but you've got to have a basic income because we're talking about people who can't afford to heat their homes, who, 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 who don't buy food, who can't, can't buy shoes for their children, whose children can't go into leisure activity. And the, the, you can't do that, you can't solve that by universal basic services. And your idea for I'm not suggesting you know, you food, can. food, well, well I mean, the, the first one you su that was suggested was um, food aid, uh, but that was going to be really heavily targeted. Yeah. I'm not, I didn't suggest food aid, sorry. Well, that was the, the, the first UBS report was published by... Oh, well, I didn't write that report. Well, maybe... Okay. That, that, but that's... That okay, <laughs> can I... Because both... There's, it gets <laughs> quite <laughs> difficult to follow exactly where the food difference is. is. Really but I just got <laughs> one a question that wasn't answered uh, at the last sorry, question, which yes. I think was, uh, well, UBI is a radical idea. How would you sell it? And I think this comes back to either or, you know, how do you sell this idea to get it, uh, you know, uh, people to vote for it? Okay, go on, Paul. Give us a go. Um, something needs to be done, and something needs to be done urgently, and certainly before five years. It, people are getting more and more people are homeless, <coughs> more and more people are hungry. And the people who are going to push for something are going to be the hungry and the homeless people fairly soon. I think um, the political scene has made it extreme and much more likely that they are going to be in a worse situation. I would want to ask several questions about you, basic income. Would it be possible to build on the work of the Living Wage Foundation and the work of Donald uh, Hirsch at Melbourne University to see whether or not it is a suitable level at every year? Secondly, um, it would be, uh, I, I'm sure you know how uh, fierce um, people collecting rent arrears and council tax arrears are. And will, um, will they be somehow protected from uh, bailiff enforcement of council tax uh, mm -hmm. or going to prison if you don't use your, uh, use your universal basic income to pay your council tax or being evicted if you haven't used your basic income to pay your rent? And where does it fit with housing benefit? And finally, um, until the housing market is sorted, you're going to have the same problem with the universal basic income as we have with the living wage, I mean the real living wage, because it is constantly, uh, uh, it's constantly dented very substantially by the housing market and rents taking money need for food, food, food transport and uh, maybe even a computer. Well, shall we, those were three sort of related questions, but if we Can did... I do that? Sorry. Well, I just think that there are many people... Here, um, okay, people but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I like Paul have too many. Job, there's an awful lot of people who want to make points. I know. And, and we're, time. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes uh, left. Uh, if we take, well, the question is, there were sort of three questions, whether those wrapped together, and people, you know, whether you can deal with a few more questions and try and pull it together. Okay, let's take a few. Mary. Um, I've heard lots about this. The thing that sells to me on uh, UBI is the, the, the um, wickedness of assessments, what people are put through uh, with, with these um, uh, sanctioning and all this. Um, and uh, I agree with Paul that um, housing uh, has got to be provided. Why can't they, why can't they build um, houses that people can 
Labour for. Local authorities used to provide housing. But basically, I don't think these things are incompatible. Do both. Okay. But, you know, the important thing is the sanctioning, the wickedness of the sanctioning that the, the UBI idea overcomes. And then okay. it's just... Get rid of the sanctioning. Whether, you know, whether you give it to them or do tax allowance, all that is academic. Okay. At the back, then. Um, this is a question of assume so you don't have any of the problems that you might have. Oh, dear. You have to speak up or we'll, we'll wait. If there were an election in the next three months, say, and there was a progressive or... Uh, even radical government elected, what would each of you propose to be done as priority, say, within the next five years? Because assuming that you can't get the whole program, what are the steps, say, the first three or four steps that you think should be taken? Okay, so we've got quite a lot <laughs> which you're going to pick. That's quite living wage, is that something to build on? Uh, the issue of punitive uh, uh, step that comes up, the element of housing, and what's the key priorities? And we'll, we'll, come, we'll have one more round after that. Um, but well, we have I mean, some brief, I, punchy answers. I think, you're, you're, I, mean, I, I think what people are saying is that, I mean, we're just proposing two possibilities to try and tackle these deep-seated social problems. One is a basic income, one is universal basic services, but we have to fire on lots of cylinders. Those two themselves wouldn't solve the housing problem. We clearly need a, a, a big social housing program. It's completely ridiculous. That, that's what, that's <coughs> one of the main causes of some of our and we also do need to do something about the minimum wage, and we also do need to do something about the progression from the minimum wage. But what, what's actually happening is that a lot of people get stuck on the minimum wage. So we need to fire on lots of different cylinders um, if we're going to solve these problems, but we have to start somewhere. So, I mean, on the, on the, the question of, yes, I mean, sanctioning... Well, I'm perhaps the council's actually being enforced. Paul, well, they call you had a good go at it. Well, well, again, give Anna a... Well, they have to use a U.S. basic income to pay off rents and council tax arrears. Well, I, I think that's a sort of level of detail. Yeah, that is a huge detail. It's life or death, some people. Yeah, yeah but maybe... Yeah. I'm not saying it isn't, yeah. Yeah, but I think a lot else would have to be sorted. Right, so you were saying you have got to... Well, the sanctions, I mean, I, I, this, is, this, is, this is a hugely serious problem. Uh, and of course, it could be changed without without a basic income. But you know, the the, the, the history is, is quite interesting. Looking at the history of sanctions over the last hundred years, and, and it, 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 this heavy duty sanctioning didn't really start until the 1980s, and it's gradually got worse. It got worse under New Labour, and then it got even worse uh, after that. So it is something that is a significant cause of deep-seated poverty in the UK. And we are talking about millions of people. Um, so, but that could be, that be a basic income would sort it because, um, you know, you could abolish it. I mean, it's very interesting that there are more, there are more um, fines levied by the DWP, again, on benefit sanctions, there are in the whole of the mainstream criminal justice system. That gives you some idea of the scale of it. But wasn't sanctioning a deliberate strategy yeah. to defend paying people because say, well, we're only giving it to deserving people and if we don't think they're deserving, we'll hit them hard. And that was a political strategy to keep, to, to maintain a level of benefit in the way that the, the willingness to pay or willingness to support people was falling to bits. So by removing that, you remove one political strategy. So you've got to find another one, haven't you? Well, I mean, there's no, sanctions don't work. I mean, there's been several... Uh, very detailed studies in the last five years that have looked at the effect of sanctions. Sanctions have had a, a negative impact upon the capacity to work. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about how it was sold, not to the people who suffered it, yeah. but the people who, were the, who weren't in the benefits things. It was, that was the audience, obviously. Well, I mean, the, yes, the, host, yeah, but the hostility yeah. that has been created by, has been created by like, ministers and, and the media it, together. You know, ministers have been going around saying, you know, there's all these idle people and, and all the rest of it, and the public have gone along with it. But, I mean, if you look back through periods, it's pos perfectly possible. Public opinion moves on this. I mean, the second half of the 1980s, public opinion was much more sympathetic uh, to uh, people on benefits than it was at the beginning, because the effects, people began to realise about the effect of unemployment. So, it is possible 
it, it, you know, it is possible to change these things. It's much more difficult when you've got you know, right of centre government to basically use benefit system as a form of discipline. It's quite difficult to challenge it. But yeah. Do I get a chance? No? Yes. Okay. Well, on the housing business, just to say quickly, we recommend uh, a housing as a universal basic service, which is not about giving everyone a free house, but is about a, um, a bundle of policies that would um, address these issues of, of scarcity, of cost, of quality, and all that gradually over a period of time. So it's not just about paying people money, it's about making sure that the houses are there and they're good quality and they're available. So that's one thing. Now, um, Peter, you asked about the, the steps. I would go for um, uh, a higher minimum wage, uh, a decent... I, I mean, I would go, probably go along with this business of redistributing the um, personal tax allowance, but that is not uh, enough to live on. And your system, Stuart, retains a lot of means testing, unless you go on to the full, <laughs> fully-fledged universal basic income. So you're going to have your means testing, which leads to things like this sanctioning that the lady there was talking about. So we're still trapped in that unless you go for a fully all singing, all dancing, universal basic income, which is why I think it is better for us to focus on uh, services, um, as, as well as making sure that the income support system is as fair, non-stigmatizing, uh, and as generous as possible, but not at the expense of services. So I would go for a better child benefit, and probably most of the four steps you outlined just now. And then I would go for um, a free uh, universal national child care service and a free universal adult social care service. And I would go for um, a much more generous uh, su support for local authorities for, to build up affordable, good quality housing and free transport over a period of time. So that's probably not the four steps, but <laughs> it's a few more than that. More but that. I would say it's important to for an incoming government of, a, of any that's going to do anything about poverty and inequality, let alone sustainable development, which should be our overriding priority, um, would, would need to reclaim the collective ideal and focus on collective responsibility for meeting the needs that we all share. So that's, and that's what we're trying to achieve with the agenda for universal basic services. Now, you, were, you had your hand up for, yeah. for a lot of this. Uh, Someone who's got a small business, uh, universal basic income concerns me um, because there's two things. Either I pay them minimum, minimum salary knowing the fact that the state will give them a top up, or I have to give them such a high salary that they come to work for me. And if that's the case, my business might be unsustainable. Um, how do you address that? I think that's coming back to your point. Um, that's the concern. And there are many small businesses, cafe owners, restaurants, and so on, who cannot afford to pay much higher salaries because of other taxes that they've been incurring, whether there's service charges for the councils and things like that. So that's, that's the issue I have with universal basic income. I much prefer the basic service because I think that's a human right for many things. Um, and you also are deciding what is a basic service, you know, health, education, and things, rather than giving the choice to the people and they can do anything they want. But come back to that, as a small business, I think there's a big concern there. Right, last question. Uh, yes, the, um, as a universal basic income, but I suspect a little bit of the services as well. The thing that worries me is if you give everyone another thousand pounds a year, which would be wonderful. I'm not worried about where it comes from. How much? Well, just a thousand, just a thousand, whatever it is. But if you did that, wouldn't you find that all the rents across the land would rise by about a thousand pounds per person? But well, we can, we did actually cover that feature, maybe you like that, yeah. But I yeah. think that's probably one of the biggest problems you'll face. But, okay, we'll just take these, we did sort of cover because Stuart sort of covered that, the, the evidence that that didn't sort of drive rent. Uh, but this question, I mean, I mean, it's interesting that is, 
universal basic service more saleable in a sense, uh, um, given the point that um, uh, it doesn't sort of um, interact in terms of wages and so forth, but actually provides things that people can get um, and meet their needs with. You want some? Well, I mean, uh, th 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 just on the, on the point about uh, small businesses and, and you know the ability to, to pay. I mean, the, 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 one of the key things about uh, a basic income is that you keep it; it's not taxable. So, when you if you're unemployed and you go into work, then um, you keep it. So there is a huge incentive to work, and you don't have to have be offered a very high salary to to change that incentive. So I don't. I don't think it would have... You're assuming that... Uh, I'll give an example. Say, for mm. example, your universal income pays me £10 anyway per hour for not doing anything. I need to... If I was to go to work, it is going to be worthwhile for me to make make it work, you know, make it worthwhile for me to work. Either I get another £20 on top or whatever. But what I'm saying is it's a level. If I only get another £6 on top because the minimum wage is £6.50 or whatever, or £7.50, I might not bother. So as an employer, I'll have problems finding people to work at that level. So in that case, I have to increase my salary to a level where I'm attracting okay. you to get out of bed because, <laughs> you know. That, that seems that people like to stay in bed, but. Uh, no, I'm, just, I, well, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure that's right, but anyway, I mean. What is the evidence on that? Because it is one of the attacks. Every, no one's going to yeah. work anymore because they get something. Well, it's also said that uh, UBI can subsidise low wages. Yeah, well, it's both hands, isn't it? Both ways. But is there any evidence in terms of do suddenly people become demotivated? And well, the, the point about it, if, if you if you if you keep it at this well, it's modest levels, i.e., the levels we talked about, uh, then it improve it, 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 it doesn't reduce the incentive to work at all. Um, because Cause it's not keep, enough to live off anyway. Yeah. It's not <laughs> enough to live on, and you, so it, it gives you some e economic security while maintaining the incentive to work. Um, and it means that you, it, the, the incentive to work is because you keep the money when you go into work, so you're much better off. Unlike the benefit. Um, well, benefit. at the moment, you lose it. So yeah. if you're on job seekers allowance, you lose it as soon as you go into work. So you're the margin, you know, the margin. The, the, you know, the margin tax rate you know, going from work to, to, to is, is very, very high. Um, I mean, there are other complications, but I, I, don't, I think the argument that it's going to destroy um, uh, the incentive to work is, uh, and the work ethic, which is sort of, you know, the critics, some critics of UBI say it's all about abolishing the work ethic, and it doesn't, there is really... Because no the robots are going to do it anyway. But <laughs> okay, um, now, I think we've definitely uh, got... Uh, Dian, you one one minute to say your last. Well, I have to turn my fire on UBI again. I'm, I'm afraid because either you're going to stay at a modest level, which will not be enough to live on, in which case you're going to need additional means testing. Mm. So you're going to get into that territory, or you're going to increase it so that it is sufficient, in which case. You undermine and you absorb, you suck up the money that would otherwise be spent on services. There isn't an infinite amount of money available. So we have to make a choice. And I say we can make a choice between um, universal basic services plus um, a, a, a partial a, or a, let's say, a, a fair, generous, uh, non stigmatizing system of income support and I think that's a question of political choice I don't think we're stuck in the mindset that we have now <coughs> so we, or with that or you go for universal basic income that's basically the neoliberal paradigm give people money to spend on what they want um, you don't do anything about sustainable development you it's an individualist anti-solidaristic approach and um, you'll you'll lose the welfare state so you know how would you go I would like to find a middle way, and I think we're not far off that, but it would mean that you wouldn't have the kind of basic income system that most advocates of UBI are calling for. Well, can I just, Stuart, just, just, one on, second. Right, you've got one. Well, on that, on that last point, I, I, don't, I don't think that's true, that most advocates of UBI are calling for big bang. Uh, not big bang. No, yeah. they want a, a little one, and then they say, on the way to... A no, big no, one. no, they, 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 like well, you. No, well, the consensus amongst most people who 
I've looked at this in some detail, is that the modest the partial scheme is the one to go for. It's, it's, it's saleable, it's progressive, it's revenue neutral, but they so it doesn't see it cost anything. First step. So it, doesn't, it, it matters whether it's the first step or whether the first step well, is where we, could, we want we, to go. We can discuss that. I mean, a, no, a, a it's really important because if you want to go to a full UBI, which is sufficient to live on, then you're in a whole different ballgame. Well, I, I don't. I don't think that's a good so idea. So why do you want to spend your social wealth fund money on income rather than services? No, no, no. no. It's a substitute. <laughs> the, 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 We're going to have to wind up now because I can see you could keep going. And you could talk over a glass of wine. Yeah. Okay. So maybe you should continue the discussion after over a glass of wine. And I'd just like to thank both of you very much for, for a very uh, interesting and entertaining discussion.